I content? Well, sure. Sure, I'm content. If, uh, if by content you mean that I believe I'm not going to be getting a raise for a long time, therefore can't buy that new flat panel television, then yes. Yes, I am content. See, the key is look at everything like it's a blessing. The house, the car, family, your health, blessings. Bills, broken toilet seat, not having a convertible, blessings. They say the grass is greener on the other side, and that is true. But only because my neighbor just had a sprinkler system put in and he got a new lawnmower. It's like one of those 500 horsepower John Doe's. It's got the uh, four titanium blades. You can probably shave with it. The uh, 12 inch rims, lift kit on it, the whole nine yard. I, mean, I think he's got a grill in the back too. Cooks steaks while mowing the lawn. But that's his world. That's not my world. Um, I'm content with what I have. I'm content with my push mower. It's my grandfather's. So it has sentimental value to me when it works. But see, my neighbor wouldn't know anything about sentimental value because all he got from his grandfather was money. Well, you can't buy sentimental value with money. You could buy my mower, but you can't buy what's in here. Unless he made me a good offer. But see, what's in here is what matters. What's in here, that's where contentment lives, in here. You gotta know who you are in here. And in here, I am not a pool owner. My neighbor is, but uh, but that's his in here, not mine. No, I don't, I, I don't need a pool. I'm content with what I have. And what I have is a garden hose. Turn it on high, use my thumb, get some good pressure going. Same thing. Pools have drawbacks. You, you get out of a pool and you're wet. You gotta dry off. I'm not saying being content is easy. I watch TV long enough and you get bombarded with advertisements about everything you need. Do I need all those things I see on TV? Probably. Am I going to get a blender that also makes salsa? Not unless my wife changes her mind. So then how am I content? Well, I'm not. I will be come Christmas when I buy her one for a gift. So sometimes uh, contentment is a journey and not a destination. Like Hawaii. I've never been to Hawaii. I'll never be to Hawaii. But I don't need to. Because I'm happy where I am. And so three weeks out of the year when my neighbor goes to Hawaii, I sneak over to his pool. That's my Hawaii. I buy some tiki torches, have a pig roast. That's my Hawaii. Same thing. So yes, I am content. See, contentment is about looking around you, seeing what's around you, what you have, and trying not to notice that your neighbor has a Ferrari. A Ferrari's a car, mode of transportation. I'm content with what I have. But would I like a Ferrari? Sure. Would a Ferrari make me happy? Yes. Am I going to buy a Ferrari? Well, I could. I could mortgage my house, sure. Am I going to do that? No. The reason, it all comes down to the C word, cost. I don't know what my house is worth. I'm having it appraised. Life is too short not to be content, to just enjoy what you have. So it's about being thankful. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that I have so little. Because if I had a lot, I would have to insure it and claim it on my taxes. Besides, the uh, Bible says that the rich are more likely to have their eyes struck out by a camel. But I don't hate my neighbor, I love him. I love him, I do, I really do. I love my enemies. To answer your question, yes. Yes, I am content. Very content. Very, very content. If I were any more content, I would be dead. That's how content I am. Ah. I love the smell of fresh cut grass and A1 sauce. No, no, I'm fine, thank you. I already ate. You guys got some uh, sauce. What
take a, a moment to, to really ask ourselves, and, and I really want to do this, I really sincerely mean this, to, to look into our, our own souls this morning, to look into our own person this morning, and ask ourselves, am I content? Am I truly content? Am I always content? Do I daily walk in contentedness? Am I, am I content? In order to look at this, I, I want to I wanna begin by reading some words of Paul this morning in the book of Philippians, if we'll turn there, chapter 4. Father God, let your word, Father, pierce anything that may be dark and allow it to be enlightened in Jesus' name. Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care but lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We probably all quoted that scripture at one time or another, Philippians 4.13, dozens of times, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? Amen? Amen. But have you ever considered the context into which that was written? Do we, do a, do we ever stop to think about what's behind the Scripture? Because a lot of times we look, we, we, we set our face to it, and we go, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But if we considered the context with which Paul gives us this. Now, this is radical, people. But if we want to be, I'm going to tell you this morning, if you want to be rejoicing, happy, and a blessed people, we got to pay attention to what Paul said here in these verses. You got to take a good hard look at them because, because contentment is learned. Woo! Amen. Amen. Say that with me. Contentment is learned. Contentment is learned, and, and it needs to be learned through experience, through gaining of knowledge, through accessing wisdom. It has to be learned. Paul says that the Lord is with me, and I can do everything through Him. Amen? I can do everything through Him, including being content in whatever situation I'm in. It's a good place to say, oh my. Oh my. Any situation I'm in, we either believe that this morning or we don't. Amen? We either take advantage of it or we won't. And the choice once again given to us by God, because He's so good at giving this, this choice to us, He says, the choice is yours. So you can believe it or not. You can experience or not. You can take advantage of it or not not. The word contentment. What do we think that word means? I mean, a lot of times we think contentment is like a hammock in the, in the back or, or swimming in my neighbor's pool, you know. Webster's 1828 says this, content as an adjective to be held, literally held, contained within limits, quiet, not disturbed, having a mind at peace, easy, satisfied, so as not to object, not to oppose. And as a noun, it is rest, quietness of the mind in the present condition, satisfaction, 
which holds the mind in peace. Restraining complaint, restraining opposition, restraining further desire, and often implying a moderate degree of happiness. Strong concordance of that word in the Bible simply says sufficient. Self-complacent. That means it's learned. That means I must make myself complacent. I have to do something that affords me contentment. And not, not, that means not chasing after the things I can't have. That means not chasing after, after my wants, my personal desires. It means relinquishing, relinquishing myself into the hands of God, whatever my condition, whatever my place in life, wherever I am and always. Whew. One of my biggest battles in life, I'll share with you this morning, is contentment. Sometimes it seems so fleeting. Huh? Sometimes it just wants to escape me. I find myself contented and then find that it was temporary. Maybe content is waiting for me around the next corner. And it is for a little while. And then I'm not content again. What's up with that? What's up with that? Well, Paul says, what's up with that, Jack, is you haven't learned. You haven't learned contentment. So hang in there, buddy. We ain't done with you yet. Amen. Amen. It wasn't until I really meditate on, on what Paul said that I found the key. There is a key to contentment. I'm going to share that key with you this morning. The key to contentment that I really want to put to work in my life as I share it with you. I share it because I realize I'm not alone in my discontent. I'm not alone. There's a lot of folks that battle the same battle of contentment. Anybody here that would like to live a life of complete contentment like Paul, say amen. Amen. Good luck. No. I... <laughs> well, as I said before, Paul's key was that it's got to be learned. Amen? It's got to be learned. Have you ever thought about that? Well, I dare say if Paul had to learn it, then I probably do too. Amen? And you as well. Far too often I find that live people learn to live a life of status quo. And I so remember Brother Rex saying status quo was Latin for the mess we's in. <laughs> we, we, learn, we learn to live there. You know, this, this mediocre thing of content today but not tomorrow, but maybe the day after tomorrow when my ship comes in. But I'm at the airport, so I'm not content again. It can become for us a way of life, and in itself is fleeting. They're just these fleeting moments of contentment, and I think most of you know what I'm talking about this morning. I think we all wrestle with that. And if you don't, praise God, I love you for that. Don't rub my nose in it, because there's a struggle going on here. Rather than living a life that reflects the power of God working in us, we wind up living a life that's kind of a business-as-usual kind of life. I've got Bible study in the morning. I get up and I open my, my bread, my daily bread, or, or, or I read a little bit of the Word. But, but then when I close it, I walk into mediocrity. We can so soon walk away from a, a personal relationship with God and open ourselves to this world of, of stress and, and worry and concern and, and un, un, or, or discontentedness. And then we find it again maybe in the evening when we come back together. Maybe I open the Bible again and I read and I go, oh, praise God, hallelujah. Boy, I really messed that up today. And try to, try to once again enter into a, a content moment with God. We risk becoming the kind of Christian that, that is more concerned about his own standard of living. What's in it for me? More concerned about the amount of haves in our lives 
than we are with the establishment of the kingdom of God. More concerned of what I got than what than what kind of a difference I can make in the kingdom of God today. All the while, we're concerned with our own living, with our own increase. There's people all around us that are dying outside of Christ. And that's probably one of the most selfish things we can do. Be self-serving when someone we know dies and we can't answer the question, did they know Jesus? Had they heard had they gained because I was busy doing me I didn't do them whoo pastor lighten up will you just like pastor appreciation day aren't we happy <laughs> what brother Paul found was something greater to live for amen but he also relates to us again he had to learn he had to learn it. He didn't just have contentment dumped on him by some magic wand of God. Poof, you're content. That gives us hope this morning. It gives me hope this morning. I hope it gives you. I hope it gives you hope as well. Today, I think for most people, contentment is like it's like an endangered species. You know, it's like like somebody saying, man, I was out for a walk today, seen one of them purple-beaked California buzzards. Isn't that amazing? Nobody sees them anymore. You know, that's kind of contentment. Wow, today I had contentment, man. It was it's awesome. It was like for 20 seconds, man, it was great. I'm going to shoot for another 20 this afternoon. Should have been yes here yesterday. I was contented you'd have really liked me yesterday, you know. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> the world has taught us that contentment is something that comes from the outside. That we receive our contentment from the outside. From what we can, what we can purchase, what, what I can wear, what I can drive, what I, what I can live in. That, that those are the things in which it's derived. And it starts as children because we, we make... We make such special times out of gift giving. I'm not knocking the special times of gift giving, but it creates in us th this thing that the only time I'm happy is when I've been given something. Well, we're as adults doing the same thing. I'm only happy when God gives me something. If there isn't a constant stream, then I got things to do. You know, check with me, Lord, next time you have a blessing. Ah, I know, I know. Something from the outside, something just beyond our grasp until somehow it comes into my grasp. And then when it's in my grasp, I suddenly lose grasp. It doesn't matter whether it's power, it's influence, it's money. It, it, it doesn't matter whether it's love, whether it's relationships, whether it's friends, whatever bounty you might seek that you think will make you whole. I want to tell you this morning, it will not. It will not bring contentment. It will not. It has to be learned. It has to be learned. Chapters 3 and 4 give us some of the principles that, that brought contentment to Paul. So, so what are they? Well, first, of course, was Paul's realization that he can't rely on himself. Amen? Amen? He can't rely on himself. Philippians 3.8, Paul says, Yes, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them rubbish that I may gain Christ. Somebody say, Wow, great, hallelujah, give me that, Jesus. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> hallelujah read that again. Yet indeed I also count all things loss 
for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Paul had to learn self-sufficiency, which is greatly lacking in the body of Christ today. He had to learn self-sufficiency. Not the sin kind of self-sufficiency, okay? There is a sin kind, but the Bible kind. Paul, part, part of the word meaning for that, for content used in Philippians is, is independence of all external resources. See, Paul had to learn that he would no longer be dependent on external resource. That's why he told the church, thank you guys. It's awesome. You sent me this blessing, man, and it was just when I needed it. It's like, you know, I didn't have I didn't have dinner, I didn't have breakfast, I didn't have, and that was yesterday, you know. I really needed this. And God God provided. Amen. Paul didn't ask him for something. God provided. So Paul was content and self-sufficient in God's sufficiency. So he was willing to let God move him, to let God sustain him, to let God work through him. Do you say difficult? Yeah, I think a little bit more than difficult. I thought about this, and, and I think it's like a castle that's under siege. Inside this castle has all the food, all the water that it will ever need for as long as the siege lasts. They need nothing. And that's what Paul found. All that he needs is inside to sustain him for as long as necessary. He has no needs. Paul would rather die than not rely on Christ. Whew. Man, there's a forkful. You remember when Satan tempted Jesus? He said, if you do this, I'll do that, right? And Jesus said, get away from me. Amen? He said, I've got all that. Don't threaten me with what I've got. The enemy comes along and wants to draw us away by showing us the things we don't have and creating in us a dissatisfaction, a discontentment, saying, if only you had whiter teeth, then everybody in the whole world would love you if your teeth were white. Get plugs, brother. Jesus said, you can't threaten me with the things I already have. So don't even try. He said, I am all sufficient in my Father. Jesus, you've been out here 40 days. No food, no water. How's it going for you? I am sufficient. See, if God had a method by which Jesus was going to go to the cross for us, then he could have been out there 80 days in the wilderness. Because God would have sufficed it for him. He would have been given supernatural life, supernatural food, supernatural water, whatever he needed. It's not the number of days. It's the God behind the number of days. It comes by learning. Paul wrote in Romans 8.28, we know that all things work together for them that love God, amen, that are called according to His purpose, amen. Paul counted everything that took place in his life a lesson in self-sufficiency, a lesson in the sufficiency of Christ. That's how he learned contentment, through experience from the greatest of teachers, Jesus Christ. We also can learn that. And, and, and it's okay. We, we don't have that. This, this isn't, isn't a, 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 a um, no one wants to throw a shroud over you this morning. It's simply saying that there is a far greater measure of contentment for us 
if we will enter in to the sufficiency of God and not order our lives by the sufficiency of our boss, by the sufficiency of our job, by the sufficiency of, of the payments I can make on my house, my car, my... my yeah, then it ends, but then I... Then. But in Christ alone, the cornerstone. We sang it this morning, amen? Let me read from Philippians. I think we have Philippians 4.13. Do we have Philippians 4.13 from the Amplified? There it is. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. Who what? Not gives me all things. Not makes it easy for me. But leads me. Who empowers me. I'm ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. That's why Paul said, I can do all this. I can have nothing and it's okay. I can have a lot and it's still okay. I can be hungry, I'm okay. I can be sitting here with my mouth full, I'm good. Because it is through Christ who strengthens me and gives me the ability to live the life today that God has called me into. Today. Tomorrow might be different, but for today, I am sufficiently infused with everything I need. Let me close by asking you again, are you content? If the answer is no, let me help you. It can be learned. If the answer is, I'm not truly content. I'm not always content. I have fleeting contentness. I, I don't walk in daily contentedness. I'll give you hope today. Because it can be learned. Once there was a wealthy man lived in Europe. He possessed a tremendous art collection worth millions of dollars. This man had only one son and loved him dearly. And that son was killed in World War II. So eventually this wealthy man died, passed away, and all that he had was brought to auction. Everything was there. On the day of the auction, there were people from all around the world to, to buy precious paintings, statues that were one of a kind. Came from all, all over the world. The attorney stepped up to the platform and told everyone that it was stipulated in his will that everything be auctioned off apart upon his death, but the requirement for him was that the portrait of his son would sell first. He said, that is my most precious thing. And so they brought the painting of his son. They held it up and the auction started. Two million dollars. No one bid. One million, no one bid. 500,000, no one bid. 100,000, no one bid. 1,000, no one bid. Finally, the man who was the servant of the wealthy man bid all that he had. He had 500 bucks. No one else bid. And he received the portrait of the man's son. The rich man's lawyer came back to the platform 
And he announced to the crowd, ladies and gentlemen, the auction is now closed. He said, according to the terms of the will, whoever purchased the portrait of the owner's son received all the rest of the collection. You see, who, whoever has the son has it all. Whoever has the son has it all. There is a secret to contentment, and it's learning 